My preferred. I want to just begin tonight, a lot of you don't know anything about myself or April, so I want to just start with a little bit of a story that will feed into some time in the Word tonight. Um, before I met April, I entered into, after finishing Bible college, I entered into a church ministry in Toronto. And we started with three young people. I had two non-church kids, community kids, and one church. By November of that first season of beginnings, we had between 40 and 45 young people. And we saw God moving. We saw young people leading their friends to the Lord. My role was helping them learn to fulfill their ministry, and we were doing it, and it was really well. That was in my final part of, I started as a volunteer, and it was in my final part of Bible college school. And so after about, uh, well, that's, that was September, in March of that first 12-month season, a good thing and a bad thing happened. The church was excited because of all this new activity and all of these young people that had not been there before. So in their excitement, they came to me one day and they said, we want to start paying you. We want to start helping you. And, and I was, wow, that's cool because I have bills and any student is struggling to pay their bills. And so that, that was a good day because for the first time some, from September to now March, I'm actually going to be helped a little bit to put this time and more time into this. That was, that was a good day. But the bad thing that happened to me at that time was I started getting paid by the church. That was a bad day. And you say, well, how can this be a good day and a bad day? It was a good day because the truth was I had personal need that this was helping empower in the ministry that we were doing. The bad was I had no idea that when that paycheck came that I was going to slowly go from being this individual that was leading this young people movement to slowly dying as I was told what I was supposed to be and I was pushed to becoming things that I wasn't. And without exaggeration, I went from being an absolutely on fire individual leading this youth movement, growing in our denomination, traveling and teaching, and all of the fun things that we were doing, within two to three years max, mm. I couldn't find a teenager. Yeah. My marriage that had happened in the flow of this was in complete crisis. Yeah. I sat on a park bench in Toronto in nothing left but depression. And I truly knew within myself, I have nothing left. Mm -hmm. And I was at a complete end. It, it, it's over. I have nothing left to offer God. In that place, the good is I cried out to God. And I just wrote a letter and I finished it with one word. And the word was help. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how help was going to come because at that moment, there was nobody in my world that I felt could actually bring some help. The help started then. The help continued for many years. 20 years ago in January coming up, my wife and I and our two young children that are not as young anymore, at the Lord's direction, he told April and I to give everything away. And we literally did, except for our two children. <laughs> that wasn't in the word. And we had a few suitcases and a couple items, but we hit the road heading east at the Lord's direction and landed here with $20 in our pocket when we got here. Yeah. And that was our beginning, January, 20 years, almost 20 years ago. Wow. Phase one of that, I didn't understand. The phase one of our journey was going to be a journey of continuing the answer to that cry on the park bench. Mm. Help. Mm. There was a rescue that had not finished in my life. Mm. And God knew the place that not only was he going to restore vision, but the place that he was going to finish the rescue. Mm. And I, I want to tonight, if you, if you have your Bibles, 
turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, because as I share the story, just the piece that I did, very brief, I want to open something from the word, Matthew 16, verse 13. I want to share with you for a few minutes how, in part, there's no way I can do it in the time tonight, but I want to give you a little nugget of how the Lord rescued April and I. There's so many layers, so so much is not on the table tonight. So it's not a formula or we've got it all done. But there's something here that if, if, my, if I succeed tonight, it will be perhaps like a door opens and a new pathway in front of you to start wrestling with the Lord for your own individual walk. And so let me read the scripture and then I'll, I'll explain to you how this relates to my story and the Lord answering the cry. So I'm going to read starting at verse 13. I'll read to verse 19. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon answered, Peter answered, and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he answered, and he said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of of Hades shall not overwhelm it or overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If we go back to verse 13, he started with a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And so he answers according to the, the crowd's perspective. Jesus drills in and he says, now let's make this question personal. Personal, personal to your own heart. Verse 15. But he said, but Simon, Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, verse 16, a very important statement. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We're going to come back to that. Verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood do not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Blessed are you, Simon, Peter, because my Father has given you a revelation and an insight that you didn't get because you went to Bible school, Peter. I didn't get because I went to Bible school, Steve. What I got, despite Bible school and seminary, was a park bench uh -huh. yeah. and depression yeah. and everything that I was touching in that era was nothing but failure. Mm. I'm not coming against Bible colleges. No. But if the Bible college was the answer to raise me up to fulfill the call of God, then either I failed or they failed. And I'll tell you this, I passed the test. And I was pretty much, by the time I graduated, a, gr a grade A student. So I certainly achieved what was needed to in the passing, mm -hmm. but yet I still landed on that bench. Yes. Simon Peter, you are blessed because you got a revelation of something that my Father has given to you. And I'll, I'll give you this little insight that when this revelation that I'm going to share with you in a moment broke open in my heart, it took so much of the cry that was in my heart in those early days that started with working with these young people. And it finally began to bring answers to why I was killed. And if we just think about the statistics for a minute in the church world, Pastorally speaking, or leadership speaking, leaders in the church statistically are not staying very long or not doing very well. 
something's got to be asked as to why. What is going on that this reality continues? And I was one of them with the potential of never being raised up from that death place. So I was in the picture of that same statistic. But I found a help that many never do. So why? Well, I believe part of the why, like I said, the table's too big to put all the food on the table. So I don't want you to think that I've said this is the absolute 100% reason. But I will tell you what I'm going to show you. This is a very important reason as to why many, whether leadership or otherwise, have fallen in to their own destruction. Peter, you are blessed because my father has shown you something. So what did the father show him? Well, if you go back, first of all, to verse 16, Simon Peter said, you are the Christ. Now, I want to suggest to you that there are three levels to this answer, you are the Christ. And I cannot unpack all three, but I'll tell you what the three are. I have this teaching on my website if you're interested in pursuing more. You are the Christ, number one. The fact that Caroline can invite me to speak tonight, and I don't have to know you, and you don't have to know me, but the question that we do want to know is, do we serve the same Christ? And just as much as Caroline said she joined us yesterday at a regional intercessors gathering, the question is, as even strangers came together from our region, do we serve the same Christ? Yes. And so there wasn't conflict in relationships, even though we're coming from different backgrounds, because this most basic and very important thing is that we together say, you are the Christ. There is only one Christ. We serve him who was sent by the Father on that mission to seek and save that which was lost. Okay? That is where unity begins. It doesn't begin by a denomination, by a network, by a church name, by the Bible school you did or didn't go to. It begins and centers on Christ. Okay? Now, now that, that I could take you the rest of tonight and we park there. I'm not. I think you get that. But at the first level of this, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, blessed are you, Peter, the first level is, this is where the unity around the kingdom of God and heaven itself is going to find itself. It's around who is Christ. Okay, so I'll make an assumption tonight. Many of us, majority of us, hopefully all of us, have no stumbling block over Christ. Okay? Now, many do, but we, I'm going to assume, you're here tonight, you wouldn't come on a Sunday night to spend time singing songs to him, about him, and reflecting on the word, if there wasn't some common heart towards he is the Christ. Okay, so there's level one. Level two. Christ in presence brings authority. Mm -hmm. yes. Two years ago, we had a man in our church, very much part of our body, very dear to April and I. And I got a call on Friday that he had just been admitted to the hospital and he's not well. I was told that he had sepsis. I didn't know what that was. He's 75-ish. I go online, I find out quickly Sepsis is an infection in the blood, and when someone gets this infection, the elderly and the children, statistically, if they live, they end up with permanent organ failure, limb loss, and 275,000 in the United States a year die from sepsis. So here's a 75-year-old in ICU, or just, he, he was admitted, quickly put in ICU, he has sepsis. So based on statistics, you know where this man's head is. Yes. It was his son that found him. They just thought he had the flu. And he, he was literally in and out of consciousness when they got him into emergency. I got the call. I went 
And I got into ICU, and I have never seen somebody hooked up to so many things as they're doing everything to keep him alive. So from a medical point of view, he is in absolute crisis, and he's been in and out of consciousness. He, he told me the only thing he remembers is he would come out of consciousness, and then he would speak the words, by his stripes I am healed. And then he'd fall back into con under consciousness. He'd wake up again and he'd say, by his stripes I am healed. And he'd fall back. That's all he remembers. That's all he could say with the weakness in his flesh. But every time he'd wake up, when they're working on him, he'd just say, by his stripes I am healed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I go into the ICU. Another man in our body did the same. And day by day by day, we walked in and we said, in Jesus' name, we speak to this sepsis. And we command you to be reversed and you get out of this body by the stripes of Jesus, this man is healed. And every day we hit this thing and we hit this thing and we hit this thing and we hit this thing. And literally before our eyes, we watched this disease work backwards and day by day the medical team changed their report. Yes. Until finally... They released him for the rest of his recovery to a normal room. All the hookups were gone. All the drugs had ceased. He is now just weak and frail, but everything is gone. And the day that he said to his wife, would you please go buy me a hamburger, <laughs> was the day I stopped visiting him to pray over him. All is well when he wants a hamburger. Two years later, he is a precious, beautiful man, part of our body. Thank you. Last Sunday morning, or last Sunday, I went to visit another one of our leaders, 79 years old. She had a stroke three days before. Last Sunday, when April and I went in, the entire left side of her body was dead. We laid our hands on her and we said, in Jesus' name, by the, his stripes, you are healed. We spoke to that body and we said, you will be raised from the dead, so come back to life. We call you back to life. And we began to pray the word of God and speak the word of God. Tuesday, the, the, a team came in and she passed a feeling test. It was dead on Sunday. On Wednesday, we went back in and she took my hand and April's hand and she was able to move her fingers and squeeze us a little bit. I said to her on Wednesday, because they, her and her daughter had shared this discouragement. Every time the doctor walked in, they get so afraid because he kept walking and giving them bad news. Well, you don't know if you're going to make it. You don't know what the outcome. And he just kept speaking this. Every time he'd show up, discouragement, they'd fight it because it was so hard. Well, this last Wednesday, after we're watching her body slowly come back to life, she, her testimony to the, with the team that worked her Wednesday morning, her body, I mean, they're watching what was dead begin to come back to life. Well, that team went out, and they're all excited because they're seeing the difference. Yes. The doctor overheard. He said, you're talking about room such and such? He didn't have a good report for that room. But I said to her on Wednesday, the doctor is going to change his report. Mm -hmm. So Thursday morning when she had this wonderful episode of, of their work and, and more progress and more was being restored, he overhears this, you know, 24 hours or so later after we said the medical report will change. So he, out of his own initiative, walked back down the hall, walked in their room. Now, as they said to me, as soon as he walked in, we both dropped our heads. Because here comes Mr. Negative. They're fighting discouragement. But this time, he sat on a chair. He didn't do that before. So the team out there are telling me, you're doing things. Show me what you're doing. She did. Before he walked out of that room on Thursday, he said, you're going to be just fine. Yes. He changed his report. Yes. Today, we were there laying hands on her again. Today, she was standing on her own strength. Seven days after her left side was dead, she's standing on her own strength. Okay? Now, I'll stop there. Here's the point. I said there's three levels of this Christ in you. First of all, our unity is centered on who is Christ. 
He is the Son of the living God. Okay? That's level one. Level two. I'm not here to teach on it. There is authority that resides in who Christ is. I can spend hours and talk to you about that authority. That's not the message. God wants us to grow up into the awareness of that authority. Personally and corporately as a people. That's his heart. But there's a third level. And this is what helped the cry in my heart from those early days begin to find a God in a way that I never knew him before. Go back to the scripture. Verse 16, Simon Peter said, you are the Christ. Verse 17, blessed are you because flesh and blood didn't give it to you. You got something from the Father. Okay, so what did he get? He got a revelation that everything will be built on. He got a revelation that there's an authority in this Christ. But there's also something else that he got. Verse 18, look at this. He said, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, pause there. You are Peter. In the Greek language, the Greek word that he used is petros meaning stone. Stones that they used to kill people with. So we're not talking pebbles like the side of our roads or some driveways. We're talking stones. Significant. And he said, Peter, with this revelation, you are a stone, meaning you're important. There's significance in who you are. But on this rock, Greek word is Petra, meaning bedrock. In their day, they would build tombs in the Petra. People would be buried. They would build homes on the Petra. People would live upon it. You don't build a home on a rock. You don't bury people in a rock. You bury people in a tomb that has been cut out of the Petra, the bedrock. So Jesus said, Peter, Greek language, you're a Petros, you're a stone. You're important in this picture. But I'm going to build my church upon this rock, this Petra, this revelation that the Father has given to you. And what's the fruit of it when I do this? He said, the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Okay? So the promise is the gates of hell will not achieve success. Now, if we, if we take one step back for a minute, and I asked you, let's do an assessment of how typically the average believer or the average church is doing when it comes to the gates of hell assaulting. Now, I'm not going to ask you for any numbers or any real assessments, but I just want to provoke the thought. Would we say a lot of the Steve story on a park bench is where many people are left? Because that was my condition. As as much as this was in my Bible back then, the gates of Hades were very much winning. Or would we find... Nothing but triumph and victory and advancement and kingdom of God invading, changing the world. And the tangible evidence is everywhere. Because look at the church and look at what God's doing. I don't want you to answer this out loud. But if we were to measure however we could do that, where do you think our answer might go? Wow, the church is thriving. Or the church is struggling. My journey, despite Bible college and seminary, was a journey of I was the church struggling. Until I cried out for help and God began to unveil some things. The third level here that I said to you, there's three. He said, Peter, I say to you that you are, as I said, a stone on this rock. The rock was not Peter. The church has not been built on Peter. 
The church has been built on the Petra, the bedrock, that relates back to the question. Peter, who am I? You are the... Okay, what was Jesus' answer or response? Blessed are you, because my Father has revealed this. You didn't get this by intellect. Blessed are you. And then right after he says you are blessed because of this, he then says, on this Petra, I'm going to build something. The Petra is not Peter. The Petra is actually the revelation that he was asked. Who am I? You are the Christ. So the first level of building is centered around the unity that we find when we recognize Christ in people. Amen. We've already mentioned that. The second realm of building, I think the church is growing into and learning more about, and that is how does the authoritative Christ get revealed? And I just gave you two cool stories, stories to illustrate that. I think we're growing. I think we're on a road where people are really beginning to get awakened, that, that there's an authority that's been given to the body of Christ that we haven't tapped into and we got to grow to learn it. Okay? We're, we're on that journey, I think. I see that. I hear that. But the third level is right now where I'm most interested in. Okay? He said, on the revelation of I am the Christ, I will build my what? Okay. Now here's where it gets interesting. The Greek word for church that's translated church is the Greek word ekklesia. E-K-K. -K. Ecclesia, okay? Now, ecclesia, the word in the Greek, had no religious history. It was not a religious word. Ecclesia was a word that referred to a people that were judicial, governing, law writing deciding the affairs of the city kind of people. Okay, so when Jesus said, hey, Peter, who am I? Oh, you're the Christ. Hey, blessed are you. My father showed this to you. I, on this revelation of who I am, am going to build my ecclesia. Okay, it's going to start. We need to know who Christ is. It's going to grow to we need to know there's an authority that he is wanting to be revealed to, to his people. But this third thing, what is the ecclesia? Well, the ecclesia, historically, that Jesus took a word that they knew and he used it to say something that I believe, to a large degree, has been lost. But he didn't draw from some religious history. He drew from actual political and governing context because they understood what an ecclesia was. An ecclesia were people that wrote the laws, the people that changed their societies. They would meet up to 40 times a year and they would legislate. Ecclesia was also a word that referred to the calling of an army together. We're going to war and we're going to take some territory. Okay? This is the Greek word that Jesus fully understood the context. Now think about it. He has come from heaven to earth to invade some territory. He is not being, oh, I hope you're happy and feel good. No. Demons, get. He just showed up. Sickness, go. You know? Where's your accusers? I'm not one of them, so rise up and don't sin anymore because it's going to kill you. So I'm trying to deliver you from what's getting you in all this trouble. You see, he walked into earth with heaven invading everywhere that he went. He was accused by the religious folk because he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. He's now a drunkard. No, he wasn't. He was bringing the kingdom to the drunkards. And he didn't have any concern that they were drunk. I don't care. I'm bringing the kingdom of God. To so the woman caught, you know, with, in adultery. He got down in the dirt and drew in the hand. Well, why did he, or draw in the sand? Why did he do it? Because not only did he expose the hypocrisy of these leaders, he got in the dirt with the woman. So what does Jesus do with the broken? He gets in their dirt. He loves them that much. Boy, the church, we throw the dirt on them. <laughs> Jesus gets in the dirt with them. Hmm. Pretty cool. What did he say to the disciples? 
How well must I be with you? When are you going to grow up, guys? You've been watching me. Why aren't you doing it? And then he could rebuke them, train them. Now get back out there and do it again. He was tough on them because he was rising up people like himself. And then the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. <laughs> you see, he was so many different things depending on whom he was ministering to, to, to the drunks, to the woman in the dirt, to the hardened of the heart. He met them where they were. Because the kingdom came to invade earth. The ecclesia, Jesus took the word and said, guys, you're watching me live as one ecclesia. Now what happens if I get a whole bunch? Amen. Yeah. We're going to start changing our city. We're going to start changing our town. We're going to start changing even our province or nation. If I get enough of ecclesia called ones to an army, to a purpose of heaven, to begin to bring the kingdom of God into every sphere of society and not say, I'm afraid of the big, bad, dark world. It's too dark. I want to go hide with my fellow believers. It's the safe place. But the ecclesia doesn't say it's not too dark. When the light shows up, the dark has to flee. So who cares how dark it is? Let's get in where the dark is. Because I'm not afraid of it. That's what you see in Jesus when he walked three and a half years. He was the light all the time. And he went, and whenever the darkness was there, it fled everywhere he was. Just get in a dark room and turn on a flashlight. Amen. And it flees every time. But this darkness wasn't literal darkness. This darkness is the darkness of the world. So walking into a hospital with one of our dear leaders and saints, darkness has overtaken her body. So all I got is all I'll give. Let's agree with heaven and let's loose it right there where her need is in the hospital. Okay, now ecclesia was not a religious word. Fast forward to the 1500s. The Catholic Church, this is not a message about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church ruled the world religious system. Very power driven, very money driven, common people had, did not have a Bible. William Tyndale, who was a scholar of multiple languages, he was a Hebrew and he was a Greek scholar. He knew, according to his reading of the Word of God, that what the Catholic Church was at that time was not what God intended. They were violating God's truth. And so William Tyndale risked his life and wrote a William Tyndale Bible to get it into the common man's hand so that people could read the word for themselves to break the system. Well, in England, they banned the Bibles and they burned everyone they could find. As a very young man, they murdered him and burned him at the stake. In the early 1600s, a man named James became king. King James. King James says, we're going to write the Bible, thus called at that time, or still the King James Version. But he put 15 rules on the table when the translators would translate it. Rule number three. You must translate ecclesia as the word church. William Tyndale translated ecclesia as an assembly or a congregation. Because the point, and you can only put so much in a, in a sentence without writing paragraphs sometimes from the Greek. It's a challenge in the Greek translation. You can take one word sometimes and write a paragraph with all that's in that Greek word. So even William was limited in how much he could put into a verse, but he chose people or congregation because the emphasis was not on a building, it was on people. Well. The problem from a governmental point of view is you have a real hard time controlling people, mm -hmm. but you can write laws about buildings. Mm -hmm. And when you write laws about buildings, well, you'll lose your permit, you'll lose your right to exist. We can control buildings. Mm -hmm. We can't easily control people. Mm -hmm. So the translators did exactly what he, they, sorry, King James told them to do. And from that day forward, the typical 
common translation of ecclesia, which is all through the New Testament, is the word church. The word church refers to a place you go for religious worship. The ecclesia is not a church. I'm saying that in the context of the way church is defined. An ecclesia is a people who take that Christ into every place of society that Christ in them has gifted and called them to go. Which means we break the box of the church that says, hey, we're going to church on Sunday. What time do you meet? What denomination are you part of? What's the name of your church? The emphasis always when we make those statements is about the place we go for worship. But Ecclesia wasn't about where they went to worship. Ecclesia was about what they were going to go out and change. Now, I'm not saying getting together is wrong. We need it. We need to grow together. We need to feed each other. We need to get in the Word like this together. So I'm not saying getting together is out of God's plan. Well, we need to get together. But when I was depressed on a park bench, what I have been taught is, Steve, now that you get a paycheck, we get to tell you what your calling looks like. And we've got your box for your calling nicely figured out. And by the time I did my best to comply to everything that that box required to get my paycheck was met, I was left being a dead man on a park bench. And my marriage in crisis as well. Not a teenager to be found in my life, despite all the passion that was there three years before, leading young people on that incredible God encounter journey. And it wasn't until we came east, and as God put us back into a local context, just not far from here, in Bible Hill, Truro area, I began to step up again with things that were in me, Christ in me, the gifts of Christ in me, the places that Christ wanted me to go. I start getting punched in the head. Steve. You get a paycheck. And exactly what happened to me in Toronto began to happen here. And every time I popped my head up and Christ in me would begin to appear in ways that didn't fit the box, I'd get punched in the head and told how wrong I was. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. There was a crash, but in that crash, there was the breakthrough. Because the penny dropped, the issue got settled, and the Lord broke this through after all of that journey. Steve, you, now this isn't just a word to me, this is a word to you. You are the ecclesia. Amen. And if you want to know what that means for you, Steve, nobody can tell you but me and you. Let's break the box. Let's shatter it. Because Christ in you, nobody has the plan and the formula to figure it out. So guess where you're going to get the answers? You're going to have to look inside and start asking, where is Christ? What giftings has he put in my life? And Steve, are you okay that this is going to take you out of the box of a Sunday context and put you into places where I'm going to release Christ in you to start changing society? Yes. Yes. And it took a bit. I was teaching one day this stuff, and one high-level government official, believer, was brought out to my seminar. Following the seminar, and I was teaching about how to find God's gifts and call in your life, but I was breaking the box off of a church concept, bringing it back to an ecclesia concept. I saw this government official somewhere I didn't expect to see a couple weeks later. And he said this testimony to me. Now, this man at this moment of this testimony is in his young 60s. He's towards the end of his career. He's not starting. He's thinking of finishing. Been a believer all of his life. And here's what he said to me. This is our province I'm talking about. He said to me, Steve, when I walked into your seminar, 
Every week I felt guilty and like a failure before God. Because in my job, he's not there every Sunday because he's traveling the nation often. He said, yeah, but here's what I was doing. Every Sunday I'm home, I'm at church. Sunday. Monday night, every second week that I'm home, I'm meeting with a group of men in a Bible study. And every Thursday night, I have a friend that I go on a prayer walk with to help me to continue in my walk with God. Now, just pause there for a minute and think about that. Does that kind of blow many believers out of the water as far as if this is his regular heart faithful commitment? Is that kind of not more than the average believer, we would say, even gives themselves to that formal gathering? So despite how much he was doing, he said, when I came into your seminar, I felt guilty and I felt like a failure before God. Because in his mind, church is a place you go for worship. But he says, I went to your seminar and I found out where the gifts of God are. I found out where the kingdom of God is. And I found out that he wanted the gifts in my life in the government to begin to be released. He said, I found out that my calling of God was actually in the government and I didn't know it. How do you not know? This is my head. How do you not know it? But he lived a, a two-fold life. I have church and I have a job. He had no clue that the job was a place where Christ was in him, that he wanted him to be in Ecclesia and release the kingdom. And he said, when I left that Saturday, I went home and I went back to my office early Monday morning and I prayed a prayer that morning that I've never prayed before, but I pray every day now. Well, what is it? God, how do you want to release your kingdom through my life today? One of, I can't tell you who, one of our government officials found out his calling was where he was, and that's where Christ was for him. But he never once even opened the door of his heart to think in terms of how the kingdom of God wanted to work right there. Because he was taught, church is the place you go. That's not Ecclesia. I had the privilege of private coaching him into leadership change. What a thrill to meet privately. And he, with nobody knowing it, I can't tell you what happened, but he did an assignment I gave him, and he literally forced change right across the nation of Canada, and nobody knew, and Ecclesia was doing it. Because he discovered who he was. I have been working right now with the business. I got a phone call from a woman, and she said, Steve, somebody, she didn't know about us. Somebody told me that you can help. So I want to find out if you can. And in the particular context, their business, her and her husband own a business that's, that's beyond the million dollar threshold. It's not a small business. But she said, we could be doing two to three times more business, but I have a problem. And the problem is her husband. The ceiling is my husband because of his leadership, because of his pride, because of things. So I told her a little bit about what we do. We booked a first session with him, with them. By his description, weeks later, he said, remember that first day? And I said, oh yeah. He said, Steve, that was pure evil. He hated me there. He wanted nothing to do with this. Because the, his way of leadership, which was killing people, was so entrenched. And I even had it at one point where he was literally on the edge of yelling at me in one of our meetings when I was just helping his heart see a different way of leading. And I looked at him in that meeting, his wife was there, and I said, I would like you to say that to me a little softer. And at that, he almost jumped. He says, I don't need this, and he's about to jump up and leave. And she confronted him right there. This is the kind of stuff that I'm dealing with privately to help this rescue. And he was fighting it. But the ecclesia brings the kingdom of God to change hearts. And of course, we kept praying. This is all private stuff. Hardly anybody even knows this is going on. But one day, phone rings, and he shows up at my door 30 minutes later. He comes into my living room, parks his butt on my living room, looks at me, and he says, just so you know, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Not bad for an opening first line. So then I said, so why are you here? Well, because my wife. Bless her heart. But you know, in the next hour and a half, 
I watched that man's heart soften and change in front of my face. I watched Christ <laughs> enter in. And then we had a meeting, he and I alone, about a week and a half after that. I saw a breakthrough happen in his heart. I heard him say, Steve, my walk away from this meeting is, and he shared something that had impacted him. That's a heart that just opened. And right now I am helping them change the entire culture of their business to a whole new way of leading that is the kingdom Jesus way of leading. And it was war, but Christ has prevailed because despite every voice and every critic and the cry on that park bench, what I didn't know was the day would come when I would get a revelation of the ecclesia and I would get a revelation of Christ, not just where our unity is, not just growing in our authority, but also Christ, who are you in me? That you want to bring into every day and everywhere I go because apparently your kingdom wants to invade so if you're held back from discovering who Christ is in you and I don't just mean Sunday gatherings then Christ is held back who wants to be unleashed in your world Nobody can tell you what he looks like in you. You have to look within and ask those questions. You can't find you by looking at a neighbor or looking at a form in someone else. We must look within and say, Christ, who are you in me? And then give ourselves permission to say, all right, Christ, help me to rise to let you loose in the world you've called me to be. That cry for help was a Christ in my heart cry mm -hmm. because I had no idea and I was not allowed even if I knew to find out what Christ looked like in me and start learning to walk that journey. Mm -hmm. So do you know what we're doing now? We're helping people find Christ in them and then ask the question how can we champion it how can we serve it how can we help it how can we see it rise up what happens to me in that process do I rise up become more known or do I diminish as people rise up you diminish because the heart of God is to see Christ in people rise up we diminish when we help others rise but what a beautiful picture what a beautiful thought. Last little story. I was passionate as a kid to be a firefighter. Came to Nova Scotia, had no clue that there's this thing called volunteers. When you're raised in the city of Toronto, it's you only know paychecks and career. So I land here and I decided with the help of a friend to apply and for volunteer for our, our fire hall. But I did it with immense guilt. What is the church going to say? I'm supposed to be doing church work. This is a distraction to your calling. And I struggled with that. It was painful. It was horrendous. But despite it, I kept pressing forward. Today, 20 years later, almost 20 years later, I've had my hands on people in upside down cars in their crisis saying, kingdom of God, come right now. I went into a burning structure. We weren't supposed to be the lead attack team. It was our neighbor's fire, but they had no volunteers show up to attack. All of a sudden, bam, two of us were put in. You're going in now. We weren't ready. We suit up. We go in. We knew the fire was to the right. As I turn to the right, can't see a thing. As I'm pressing towards, I then see the orange. So we're moving towards the fire to attack, and I'm the lead. And all of a sudden, the voice of God on the inside of me, I heard, stop. And I did. I swung my leg, and I was less than a foot from death. Oh I couldn't see a thing. 
but I was less than a foot from going into the hole because the fire, which we didn't know, started in the basement of this house, burned up into the kitchen. The entire kitchen floor was now gone, and it was extending itself into the dining room where I was at that moment on the lead nozzle. But the voice of God at the moment of need showed up. I pulled back, attacked the fire a bit, got out, notified the next crew exactly where what was there and where not to go. Two things about that story. First of all, knowing the voice of God is what saved my life. But notice where I heard. Was it in a nice praise church service? It was on the front line of something that God put in me to do. That's where his voice is, when we're places that he calls us to be, and we grow to hear and know him. Okay, That's cool. That's important, because I didn't die that day when I could have circumstantially. But potentially equally important is it's really weird to pull up in a fire truck as the support to a fire hall, and they had three fire trucks, all the hose lines drawn, and no firefighters to attack that structure. That's just weird. Everything there except for anybody to go in. And we were thrust in suddenly. Do you know what? I became shortly after we were starting the attack, so now we're doing their fire. But you know what I think God may have done? What if somebody like me that didn't know the voice of God was going into the same structure? I'm left thinking, Lord, did you just save somebody's life because you had an ecclesia pressing into the darkness? hearing from you at the point of need? Could somebody have died tonight if you didn't have one of your kids had been trained to know your voice and willing to be where you've gifted him and called him to go? Could, is it possible that somebody could have died? And my answer is, I can't prove it to you, but my answer is, I think so. Is it possible that the Christ in us could actually be someone else's life being saved? It's that important? To the heart of God that we fulfill what he has put in us. But it's not me. It's Christ in me. Amen. We're going out into the places of darkness. To be what he's called us to be. I urge you, as I conclude, to consider this thought. Is there more of Christ in you? Like the government story like the firefighter story, like the business helping change a leader's heart story? Is there more of Christ in you that has not been allowed to be released? But if you don't recognize Christ as the author of the things that are in your life that he has put there, then you can just push Christ aside. And then be religious. I just want to praise you, Jesus. He says, I love your praise. But would you let me be loosed? <laughs> Keep praising me. But would you let me be released to what I've put on your life? I, I, I urge you to consider, is there places of Christ that have not been allowed to be revealed? Just like my agonies turning into some trophies. Christ in you wants your agonies to become his trophies. But he has to be released. Yes. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the revelation of Christ. Where our unity is, where our heavenly authority is, and where our uniqueness is. It all flows from you. And I pray, God, that you would cause revelation to come forth to us, to open our eyes within ourselves to see Christ in a way that we've not understood him to be present in our life. Thank you, God, that every one of us are Peters, every one of us are stones, meant to be used by you to bring some kind of impact and change. Help us to see the places of your desire to have that released. I praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just one concluding um, 
Caroline had said on the back table there, we didn't bring any material to, to make available to people tonight, but there is on the table little laminated cards just with some of the seminars that we do. There's also little cards there if you if you want to connect with our website. Some of the teaching I did tonight is, is on our website. We have free teachings and we keep adding to it as as we as we continue to grow. So there's a probably twenty five to thirty teachings right now that are available for free, as well as some of our seminars, some teaching articles that is all there just to help you be activated in the call of God in your life. So if you're interested in any of that, just take a card. And, and just go on our website. And lastly, there's a brochure we printed. It's not pretty, it's just a, a black and white. But in Truro, at our home base next month, we're teaching what, what I've written called God's Foundational Blueprint for the Church. This is a newest release that I feel tested in February and then in June, and now we're starting to hit the road with it. Ecclesia is in here. So a bit of what I taught tonight. God's intent for his church in a way that really challenges our thinking, if we let the word of God come out front, is in this. It's a Friday night, Saturday, if you're interested in it. The brochure is there. We can email you a PDF brochure if you want that. Just email me and take our card. But anyone can come. We, our manuals are $10 at our events, the Lord told us, never to charge for our ministry. Doesn't mean we don't have needs, but we will not put money on the table. So we sell the manuals for $10. If you can't afford it, we give it to you. Um, but the cost is $10. There's an opportunity to give it the event to sew into it, but there is no cost for you to participate. So it's a Friday night, Saturday. Brochure's there. If you have any questions, ask. But just want you to be aware of what's there. And we'll, I'll have April put this back on the table there with that. And we can answer the questions. So bless you, Caroline.